guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. I thought yesterday was a classic vintage Kirk Cousins game because this is a classic Kirk Cousins team. He will do this, and they will lose. What was the final score? 34 to 23. Right. Okay, so he did what you said he did. He threw for 425 yards. Yeah, 10 incompletions. 25 <laughs> yards. That's insane. And Justin Jefferson catches 11 out of his 15 targets for 223. He should have had more because he didn't step out of bounds. Okay, wait. Was that Skip and Shannon clip? Was that just before Skip personally attacked Shannon uh, for not being as good as yes. Tom Brady? And then Shannon yes, got offended? I, I, or did they make I, up and that was after? I believe it was before. Uh, I saw had the clip. to have been right. Yeah, had had to have been that clip by their body language. Unbelievable! What when was Shannon that? Shannon takes so off his weird. glasses and skips like, "Put your glasses back on." It's, this was really <laughs> uncomfortable. Like even for sometimes Skip, when Judd like, takes off his glasses, I've thought yeah. about saying, "Put okay. your glasses back on, Zolgad." Oh God! What was, was so, so? What was his point? Bad. His point was. Was Tom Brady is still you don't stop disrespecting Tom Brady. He's yes. better at forty five than you were at thirty five. And Shannon's like, I was a Hall of Famer guy. Why are you ripping? Why are you ripping and me Skip to make said, your point about I Tom Brady? I don't care. He's or, better than you. Oh my god! Yeah. Ooh. I love how they've gotten rid of the random third host. I think Jenny Taft used to be there. They've had a couple different ones. And they've just finally now they've said, you know, we don't even need that. Let's just put these two guys in an oddly dimly lit room. And they can just serve the ball back and forth for two hours just arguing about things. Okay. Yeah, but I think this might – I'm curious because that didn't appear to be fun. Like, that didn't appear to be – No, that guys. was real. That was that real. Was, Dude, I'm, Shannon was like – he was like lurching over the table ready to hit skip, punch Skip. Would would there have been a petition for, for like, you can't fire Shannon Sharp? Like, if, if he had gone across and just, like, throttled him and grabbed him by the neck and threw him down – and of course, he'd be su- subject to termination immediately. Would there be an outcry from the public of "Oh no, no, Skip got what he deserved"? I think it could be one of the best things to happen to that show. I think that show does it does well enough to where Skip makes like six or seven million dollars, and Shannon probably makes around the same. And it's been on TV for like five years. I just got done listening to the the Ringer has a podcast about like famous late '90s WWE moments. Mm-hmm. And so I just got done listening to a Montreal screw job one and some other stuff or like they like the Mike Tyson one where they brought Mike yeah. Tyson in and he punches Shawn Michaels. They should do that. They should literally have wouldn't it be amazing if after all these years, Skip Bayless just got knocked out on national TV. If he was in on it, said, you know what? This would jack our ratings through the roof. You're going to personally insult Shannon Sharp. Would you? I'd watch that. I'd watch that. If he he's going to punch Skip on out it. on TV. If he wasn't in on it, I would not only watch it, I'd love it. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Nobody deserves to be knocked out like Skip does. And that's the difference between Skip and Stephen A. Yes. Is that Stephen A. does it with sort of a wink and a nod. Mm-hmm. Skip doesn't. Skip's just an ass. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> I think if you had a contest for, like, who's smarter, like, who's more savvy... Stephen A. Steve. Super smart. Oh yeah, I think yeah. Skip's probably smarter than people think too. For you to be making that much money doing right, but he's such talking a jerk. head media. If if somebody got up and hit Stephen A., I'd be like, oh dude, come on, don't do that. Skip, I'd be like, yeah. Skip's one of the greatest sports media heels of all time, of all time. Anyhow, that's not what yeah. we're. That'd be a great pecking order at some point Cosell? for you, maybe. Cosell there you up go. there. I want you to work on that. The greatest sports media bad guys of all time for a future pecking order. Pat okay. Royce, bad guy. Patrick Royce, yes. <laughs> uh, today's pecking order is all about beleaguered Vikings coordinators. All right. I have for you guys a list of the nine most beleaguered coordinators in Vikings history off of all this conversation about should Ed Donatel be fired? We're going to dive much more into that on Purple Daily here. Uh, later today too, but I have a list of nine. We'll start with nine. We'll work our way up. Okay. You tell me if I'm missing anyone in here. Okay. But I'm basically going off of Vikings coordinators who people were pissed at. Fans were pissed at. Maybe their job was on the line or they got fired, but where people were just ready to get this guy's ass out of here. Or if I could use a better clip. Yeah. 
Let's start with number nine. Okay. Clint Kubiak. For a couple reasons, he makes this list. I think he was the face, one of the main faces of Vikings nepotism. You had a few. You had during the Mike Zimmer era, you had, you know, tragically his son Adam. Yep. That's a terrible situation. But in the moment, you know, people, oh, his son, of course, his son's on the staff, right? Scott Turner was on the staff for a while. Clint Kubiak's on the staff. So I think Clint being one of the faces of Vikings nepotism and then, oh, he's just going to kind of run his father's offense. But his dad is the is the uh, advisor just up in the press right. box. Pe- people just – and he was like 34 years old or 35 years old or something. So people were just kind of annoyed from the get-go. Really, Clint Kubiak's going to be the coordinator? We can't, can't bring in someone a little better than that? Yes, it's a good one. Not full on outrage over Clint Kubiak, but right because it went to Zim as well, probably more so. So yes, yes. Okay, number eight, offensive coordinator Daryl Bevel. So Brad Childress took the main abuse, I think, from fans, but specifically between 2006 and 2008, before Brett Favre arrived, Daryl Bevel was Brad Childress's lackey and one of the two faces of the kick-ass offense, quote-unquote. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This, this sort of three yards and a cloud of dust and punt. Oh, this is a kick-ass offense? Travis Taylor is your best receiver? You got Tavar- Tavares Jackson is your quarterback? Gus Farratt? And so Daryl Bevel definitely took some of the debris when, uh, when they were trying to run this just terrible offense for three years before Brett Favre arrived. And Daryl probably, uh, he did take some of the debris. Now, what was interesting is Daryl also probably saved Brad from himself at times um, for a multitude of reasons. One is, in 2006, Brad's first year, Brad called plays. And he hadn't called plays for, for Reed in Philadelphia. And Brad wasn't good at it. He was bad. So in 2007, uh, Brad Childress started to defer to Daryl. And Daryl actually did a decent job and... Keep in mind, too, Brett Favre doesn't come here if Daryl's not here. Like, Daryl had been his position coach in Green Bay. Um, you know, Brett and Brad were never really close. Like, like they they knew each other from Brad having made a trip when he was the OC, I think, at Wisconsin. Uh, so there was a relationship there that was very, like, just um, uh, on. They were, you know, friendly, but not friends. Daryl Bevel was the, the key. So you're right. Daryl took some shrapnel that he probably didn't deserve because Daryl probably saved uh, Brad from himself more than once. He was a pretty yeah. good o- offensive mind, and he's still, I think, still around with the Dolphins now. He's yeah, well, coaching did, with the Dolphins. Didn't he also? I think he was the offensive coordinator for the infamous Marshawn Lynch didn't get he the was. ball the one yard line game. He right? was yes. So he's had a couple. He was the offensive coordinator for the Brett Favre interception. In the yeah. 2009 title game and for the Russell Wilson interception right. against the Patriots. Very interesting. Okay, number seven, mm-hmm. defensive coordinator George O'Leary. So he was more beleaguered before he got to the Vikings because if you remember, yes. he 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 was named in 2001, the, and as a huge Notre Dame fan throughout my life, my grandpa played there, uh, I was very excited about George. Okay, George O'Leary. That's a guy with an Irish-sounding name. Okay, he's going to come in here and think he took over for that Bob Davies guy or whatever. Uh, But he lied on his resume to get the Notre Dame job and then got fired like five minutes later, never coached a game for Notre Dame. And then he sort of tucked his tail between his legs, and I think his next job was joining Mike Tice's staff as like an advisor in 2002. Mm-hmm. And then he became the defensive coordinator in 2003. That was his only year as a coordinator for the Vikings, because after starting six and zero, the Vikings defense, the Vikings, so the Vikings lost five of their next six games, and the Vikings defense allowed 32 points per game over that month and a half stretch to just shipwreck the season. And so they were on life support going into the final week, had to win a game against the absolutely terrible Cardinals on the road just to get into a, a wild card spot. And the season culminated with a defensive meltdown in the end zone where Nate Poole catches that pass, the infamous Paul Allen clip, right? The Cardinals oh. have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs. With that prevent defense, that was a George yep. O'Leary defense. Total meltdown second half of the season and against the Cardinals to derail a 6-0 and start. Very fair. 
And you were covering the Packers that season? Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. In fact, I was covering right the the Packers play were, were uh, killing the Broncos in what appeared to be a meaningless game because the Vikings were going to get the playoff position in the uh, division, and then that happened. Yeah. And there's celebration. They showed it Lambeau on the big Field screen. Lambeau Field went nuts. All, the, the fans all turned around towards the suites to watch that play. Yeah. Because, like, the Packers were up 31-3 to at that point. So that game was done, and then that play is completed. And the stadium, with, like, a run play going on in the actual game in front of the fans, uh, the stadium goes absolutely nuts. I believe, wasn't that the year the Packers gave up the 4th and 26 to Freddie Mitchell against the Eagles? Yeah, 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 which is funny. And the uh, defensive coordinator there will will maybe be on this list later. (laughs) Exactly (laughs) right. And and let me say this, too. It is more impressive when, when you pick a DC, in my opinion, because OCs are always right, like like play. He's a bad is, play caller. Yeah, like yes. I mean, we we don't even re- really think of defense as as uh, play calling. Like like we don't dissect it ordinarily. You know, offensive coordinators we dissect. Why are you throwing a screen pass there? Yeah. So so for a DC to get on this list, you've got to be a special type of putrid at times. Number six, another defensive coordinator, Foge Fazio. So Foge was, he was the defensive coordinator after Tony Dungy left to take the Tampa job in like 96. And then Tony turned the, turned the Buccaneers around, didn't quite get them to the final stage, but he turned the Buccaneers around and then eventually John Gruden took over and they won a Super Bowl. But Foge Fazio took over for Tony Dungy, who had excellent defenses with the Vikings. So these late 90s Vikings defenses, and their defense was okay in like 96, 97, but the further they got away from Tony Dungy, the worse those defenses got. 98, the defense was the rickety thing on that team. Historical offense, defense that was just kind of hanging on, trying to do what they can. And then 99 was just a defensive disaster for the Vikings. So Foge Fazio, as the leader of the weak link on those great offensive teams, and if you remember, the last game Foge Fazio coordinated was the Vikings in the playoffs. I think it was the divisional round against the St. Louis Rams. Oh, yeah, that, you had no shot. In 1999, the greatest show on turf ran the Vikings out of the building. And so um, Foge Fazio makes this list. A great football name, though. Just a great football name. Foge Fazio. Foge Fazio. Fazio. That, that is the... the, the uh, uh, name that, that we d- discussed l- last week, Billy Rigney of the Twins, right? <laughs> Foge Fazio is the football Billy Rigney. That's just a crusty guy who you can imagine with a cigar in his mouth. Yes. Swearing ah. up and down that his players can't accomplish what he wants. So Foge Fazio. Um, I don't know. I don't feel super confident in the actual like w- one through nine rankings here. You might have to correct me on some of these. So we'll get to the top five here in a moment but this pecking order presented in part by our friends at underdog fantasy show us your slips america all right let's take a look at george's slip from over the weekend here look at this little five item parlay for our guy george he uh he wrote some overs in vikings and lions including overs on justin jefferson dalvin cook kirk cousins tj hawkins and even kirk cousins higher fantasy points for jared goff it happened it happened. So uh, a good over there for our guy, George, and he gets a nice little paid on underdog fantasy. The best and easiest way to play fantasy sports, you can join with promo code SCORE, S-K-O-R. They'll match your first deposit up to $100. Go join Underdog Fantasy and download the Underdog Fantasy app. And a shout out to our friends over at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. They've been helping us grow our business over the years, you know. As we build this thing at Score North, Mackie and Judd, our YouTube channels, et cetera. So uh, thank you to them for that support. They've been acting as a guiding hand and a great partner to countless businesses in and around the state of Minnesota and outside since 1904. If you're looking for just a better offensive line for your business, helping you navigate the waters of business, check them out at federatedinsurance.com where it's our business to protect yours. Okay. Back to the pecking order. Top five into the beleaguered Vikings coordinators list all time here. Number five, this was more of a guy that was be- more, I think he was more beleaguered behind the scenes than publicly, but he was definitely beleaguered in both settings. Norv Turner. Hmm. The shine wore off really quickly on Norv internally. When he got hired, I remember Judd and I were just like, wow, Mike Zimmer. 
comes in here. He's never been a head coach before. He's a defensive guy, and he brings in one of the most, I think, revered offensive coordinators and offensive minds in the NFL at that time, North Turner. What a great partnership. Look at Mike Zimmer bringing on these these former head coaches on his staff. And, it, and then it turned out later on he just hired a bunch of people he could put his thumb on <laughs> for the last five years. But if you remember, Teddy Bridgewater was playing behind, especially that second year, he was playing behind a really rickety offensive line. They had injuries, just backup caliber guys, and Norv kept running plays with seven-step drops. And so every game it was like Teddy would go these long developing routes and Teddy is going back five, six, seven steps. And by the time he hits the top of his drop, it's like there's six guys in the backfield ready to destroy him. Right. Um, so fans were frustrated with Norv, but I think the fact that there may or may not have been an altercation that may or may not have turned physical between Mike Zimmer and Norv Turner no one in the middle it. of the season, Norv Turner and Mike Zimmer had some sort of huge blowout that resulted in Norv leaving in like November or whatever the time period was. Yeah. Um, so Norv Turner, number five for being beleaguered internally and externally. That's fair. I might put boy, Kubiak, Clint Kubiak might go in my five hole and Norv might go down to like eight and Bevel might be nine, <laughs> but yes, Norv was de Norv definitely had the, the seven step drop thing was hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like, like okay, guys. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. What? Why, Nor? What are you doing? You have backup left tackle. Zim, you know what, Mike? I, the beginning of the end with Norv with uh, with with Zim was when Zim, after his first year, decided to call up and consult his old friend Hugh Jackson about how offense should cool. run. I mean, Hugh Jackson, of, who had like two wins and. Three seasons as a head coach. And like if you're Norv, you, you've coordinated Emmett Smith and Aikman. Like you have had some coordinating yeah. success, right? And yes, he calls up Hugh Jackson. I think that's where Norv said, I might have to check out of this place before long. There was a major as as I and we have sort of heard behind the scenes, there was at some point in a sit down, there was a major clashing of egos where Zimmer is pissed and being a hothead and telling Norv what he thinks. And Norv basically saying you don't know a third of what I know about, you know, offense and football. And... Probably correct. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go Team Norv here. That brings us to number four here. I'm putting Ed Donatel fourth. Wow. I think the vitriol, people are calling for this dude's head in a 10-3 and three season right now. So this this I'm this is probably recency bias here, I'll, I will admit. But if they did put his face on the video board... Much like oh they did with someone who will be ahead here in the pecking order, um, I think he would get booed out of U.S. Bank Stadium. I think he is enemy number one among the Vikings the fan base. Board? Can you imagine <laughs> if they just trolled him? And he seems like, by all accounts, and Alex Boone knows him from you know previous football run-ins. He says Ed Donatel is one of the nicest, most genuine humans. Just a guy that will just oh, come yeah. over to your house and you know. But um, he's having a bad season. And KOC, we'll talk more about this on Purple Daily today, but KOC basically said, I'm not thinking about making a move yet. Yeah. Yeah, KOC <laughs> dropped So the pressure's on. Times. Yeah, I thought you might have, have him top three. So I, I, I think four right now, uh, yes, there's probably some recency bias there. But given the fact, again, he's a defensive guy and we can't stand him, I just think that's impressive. Yeah, and sometimes we don't even know. I mean, most fans don't like know why they don't know why a defense isn't working, and most media doesn't know why a defense isn't working. But you just know that it's not working, and you want the guy that oversees it to be held accountable, right? Yes, I also think on defense, um, if the eye test says that they are that they are applying pressure and that the players just all suck, then then it's like, yeah, it's unfortunate. But I think what we're seeing with with Ed and what's being coordinated here is is what we talked about, which is the passive play, right? Yeah. It, it's like at some point in time, you say to yourself, "Does the middle of the field always have to be wide open?" <laughs> right. I Are think that's you, a fair question. And a defense with even Zadarius Smith at like eighty percent, and Daniel Hunter just can't get any pressure on Jared Goff or Mike White. You know, it's just kind of kind of weird. Okay. Now we enter the top three. 
I think number I three on the beleaguered Vikings coordinators list is an yep. offensive coordinator yep. who was here for yes. uh, a, a very brief period, John D. Filippo. Okay. John D. Filippo was hired by his proximity to success. The Philadelphia Eagles, with a backup quarterback, came into Minnesota and beat yep. the Patriots in a shootout Super Bowl. And they blew the doors off with, again, a backup quarterback, the Vikings, in the NFC Championship game. So the Vikings had a front-row seat NFC Championship game and then a home backyard Super Bowl mm -hmm. at the innovative Eagles offense. And I believe the pecking order at that point uh, for the Eagles offensive leadership went Doug Peterson, head coach, Frank Reich, offensive coordinator, and John Filippo, quarterback's coach. So they figured, all right, we're not going to get Peterson because, you know, he just won a Super Bowl. Right. Frank Reich's going to get a head job somewhere. Okay, who else can we poach? <laughs> How about the guy that was in the quarterback room with Nick yeah. Foles? Let's get that guy. Bring him over here. You know what it is? It, it's the offensive equivalent of Ed Donatel. <laughs> well, kind of. But, he knows the guy. But Donatel was a coordinator, at least. Right, but for Fangio, so it's the same thing. Ed, here's what we're going to do defensively. <laughs> okay, coach, thanks a lot. It would be like if, because Ed's been a secondary and a linebacker's coach before. It would be like if Ed was a linebacker's coach at the time of elevating him to coordinator or something. Uh, and that's what you do. You elevate you elevate position coaches to coordinators. And I think Filippo had been a coordinator twice before, for sure with the Browns, maybe even somewhere else, or maybe in college or something, but... The idea was, all right, going to bring Filippo in, going to bring Kirk in, and Filippo is going to elevate Kirk to new heights. And it yeah. worked pretty well the first month. Kirk was kind of 350 yards here. There was the Packers game, 400 yards. And then the Vikings became one of the most pass-happy teams in the league, and Mike Zimmer was not comfortable with that. And so week after week, Zimmer would get up at the podium and publicly fillet Filippo for not running the ball enough. It it was like a public falling out within two months of Filippo's time here. And Kirk was in shotgun constantly, which he didn't like. Yeah. And so yeah, I think John, so. John thought that, that he was that he was going to coordinate for like a star QB. And what we didn't know at the time was Kirk can be very, very good, but he needs he needs basically a guy who's like, okay, what do you want to do, right? And so I think that's where, and I've heard stories now that it was more Spielman that pursued Filippo, and then Zim got stuck with it. So like Zim felt doubly stuck. Yeah. So he's like, this guy's my coordinator, and this guy's my quarterback. I didn't pick these guys. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and it blew up what, like week 10 or something, they pulled the trigger and they just fired John DeFilippo. Why did Kirk so. throw backwards against the Seahawks in Seattle? <laughs> uh, was that 18? Might have been 19. I think that was the next year. 18 okay. or 19, yeah, because I think they played it back to back. That was just there, the yeah. early Kirk days. I remember the chaos. Oh. Yeah, the yeah, fact right. Latavius Murray turned that into a neutral play was nothing short of a miracle. And it should have been it should have been a play of the year. <laughs> I'm open. Thielen's like, I'm open on the sideline. <laughs> um, all right, number two, and this is where you might disagree. I've got Bob Schnelker, number two. So for the younger audience here, I'm going to take you back to, and we can't play this because it's literally, it's a five minute, it's an infamous Jerry Burns press conference after a Vikings victory. And I'll lay this out here, but November 5th, 1989, the Vikings win 23 to 21 at home over time. They beat the Rams to go six and three. Okay. They're coming off. They went to the NFC Championship game two years before. Uh, you know, they've, they're on a playoff stretch here. They're 6-3. and three, Big home win. And this is the write-up from the Daily Norseman. The score might look like a fairly conventional football score, but the Vikings got to their 23 points in a quite unconventional manner. The points came as a result of seven field goals from barefoot kicker Rich Carlos. Five of the seven field goals came from inside 30 yards. So they just stalled out like at the five yard line five different times. That was enough to send the game to overtime. And the Vikings won courtesy of a blocked punt from Mike Merriweather that uh, went out of the back of the end zone for a safety. It was the first overtime safety win in NFL history. Interesting. When you kick five field goals of 30 yards or less, it means your team is having red zone issues. And when the Metrodome put a picture of offensive coordinator Bob Schnelker on the video board, the crowd booed him out of the building. And apparently Schnelker felt really bad. They went into the tunnel. They won this game. They're 6-3. and three. 
and he tells Jerry Burns, like, why are they booing me? I feel like this is really sad. And Jerry Burns lit into the media and the fans for a five-minute infamous. There's about 50 F-bombs. Every other word is an F-bomb, so we can't run it here. But uh, right. that's where that rant came from, people hating Bob Schnelker. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard not to put Schnelker one. I, if I'm not mistaken, so 89 in the Metrodome, they I did they didn't have video boards per se yet. With with um, they they had like black and white ones. So I think they did show a picture of Schnelker, and I think it okay. might have been at the start of the the game. You know, the Vikings coaches Jerry Burns, the coordinators are, and and it was like that pixelated like black and white type of picture. Wait, so that happened at the beginning of the game? That's my guess. And is he that, was pissed for 3 happened? hours and came. They didn't oh have a God, like a hilarious. coherent back then. It wasn't like a, you know, color board where they they'd show like uh sidelines and stuff yeah. like that. So and didn't I think they, that, didn't they yeah. put in the second one because of the Super Bowl? Like cuz there was did. two, right? Like there oh, was yeah. one the original and yeah. the second yeah. was added after the Super Bowl. The left the field one was there from 80, 81 through the Super Bowl as a standalone. And then, Dex, you're right. For the Super Bowl, they, they put in the one that was basically above the first base dugout upper deck. Um, but the other thing in retrospect that we probably didn't think about at the time was Burnsy was also pissed off really badly because he was the one coordinating the offense, not oh, Schnelker. Okay. Burnsy was the, I mean, Burnsy is given a ton of credit by football football people for being an innovator before Bill Walsh of the yeah. West Coast. He was. I mean, he was, yes. Those Vikings, so people talk about the Vikings, line. the Vikings defenses are the thing that everyone remembers from the 70s, but like those offenses were incredible too. Oh, and Burns and was the, the coordinator. And the short passing game. So I think, I think where Burns took offense was he didn't want to come out and say, I'm calling the plays. And yeah. I don't know that, that he was, but it was his offense. So it wasn't like Schnelker was, was you know, this guy working by himself. Uh, so I think he felt bad because Schnelker was being totally dumped on for yeah. Burnsy sins. So if you get a chance, just just Google or go to YouTube, Jerry Burns tirade or press conference and you'll, you'll get it, or Jerry Burns Schnelker. And number one for me, and this is, I, you, you probably disagree here, but because it, it's, it's more of a recency bias thing, but I have... Offensive coordinator Bill Musgrave <laughs> as the most beleaguered coordinator in Vikings history. I was waiting. Me too. In fact, so, I, already did, I already did an old tweets exposed comb with your guys' name and Bill Musgrave. <laughs> Bill Musgrave. So, yeah, it ended pretty quick. It didn't. No, no. I'm saying. I'm saying. If, if we said good things about Bill, it ended oh, pretty quick. I was like, we, his tenure didn't. He was here for three years with that tiny ass play sheet. After you Brett know, most most great offensive minds have like a, a full Perkins menu that they just yep. like. Andy Reid is hiding behind a wall of plays. Yep. And Bill Musgrave had a little like Declan. Yeah, he's got like a bill, like a billfold. Uh, he oversaw one of the worst passing offenses <laughs> in the NFL for three years. Mm -hmm. He had that tiny little play sheet. He was the one that was going to develop first round pick Christian oh. Ponder into the Vikings franchise quarterback. And then that didn't happen. The Vikings go into a playoff game against the uh, the, the Eagles. No, the Packers. It was that cold game against the Packers, right? The After Joe the Webb Peterson, uh, the Joe Webb. All right, Joe Webb's going to start. All right, offensive coordinator. What what do you got? Nothing. This literally the same system. Joe Webb dropping back for three hours, not using his legs. People hated Bill Musgrave. So I'm putting him number one. Musgrave, Schnelker, DiFilippo, Donatel, Norv Turner, Foge Fazio, George O'Leary, Daryl Bevel, Clint Kubiak. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably flip Bob and, and Bill, but Bill was despised. My, my favorite Bill uh, story was I was covering a game. It was, I think it was his first year in the old Metrodome press box, and a drunk fan stops in front of the press box and looks up where he knows there are coaches and just starts screaming, Hey, Musgrave! Oh hey, God, Musgrave! Dude. And the best thing was Bill on the sidelines. So this guy was like trying to <laughs> accost Bill Musgrave in the coach's box, and he was not in the in the coach's box. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe Bill just needed more of a bird's eye view of things. Just you go, know, go up to the press box. It's funny because uh, Pelissero, when he went to cover the Senior Bowl, I think for us at the time, uh, was allowed in. It was... It was Frazier's coaching staff. So Bill was the OC for one of the two teams. And Tom said that he was allowed access to the like night before or something where, where uh, Bill breaks down the offensive players and talks about the game plan and stuff. And he said he was so dynamic. It was incredible. Hmm. Like just controlled the room. Because I'm like, what are you talking about Bill Musgrave? Because he was the most meek yeah. like football guy. 
I, you know, he was basically would whisper. And I was always amazed. I'm like, how does this guy control yeah, so a bunch gonna, of... Uh, hey guys, yeah. So we're going to yeah. run... Uh, he seems nice enough, okay. but... We're going to... Yeah. Let's get run some slants. Okay. So he there you go. There's your, there's your pecking order here. We love to rank Great things. Pecking order. I'm Great pecking order. Great pecking order. We're going to take a... Everybody. Take a break quick, and we'll come back with the biggest Vikings fan we know. Check on him. I'm guessing we're going to get a dud stable from our guy, Randy and Cottage Grove, on Mackie and Judd.